So once again, welcome. And before saying anything, I want to thank Anna Marie Buenviaje for her organization for handling the logistics of, of this meeting and our previous lecture meeting with Sarah Neuter. And I want to thank Catherine Levy and Jennifer Gielli in the Institute of Arts and Humanities in the Dean's Office for all of their help and all of their work with classical studies and the program in Hellenic studies. So let me begin with an expression of my great pleasure to welcome Edith Hall today. Um, Edith is really one of the world's leading experts in the history of classical culture. And I'm sure many of you know her work. She's written and lectured on just about every aspect of the classical world uh, with special interest in the history of gender and identity, in uh, ideas of race, uh, in Greek theater, Homer, Aristotle, mythology, the history of classical scholarship, and the role of women in classical scholarship. She comes to us today, not just as a scholar, but as a public advocate and really an autobiographer of the intellectual and scholarly life. I, I don't think anyone has the level of audience that Professor Hall has right now. Everything she does is really about the public. It's about advocacy, whether it's about advocating for language teaching in the secondary schools, state supportive education. If you go to her own website, um, it's edithhall.co.uk. Is that it, Edith? Yes. It's, 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 it's really, it's, it's a model for a professional website. But one of the things that I think is most important there is the way in which she explicitly says how she prides herself on having been educated at the expense of the British taxpayer. <laughs> and it seems to me that here at the University of California, the flagship public university system in the United States, our commitment to access and advocacy will certainly resonate with Edith's own. And uh, many of my own students, uh, former undergraduates and current undergraduates are here today. And I really wanna thank them for engaging in this, uh, in this presentation. Because my hope is that what we'll be talking about again is not just scholarship itself, but the individual's commitment to a scholarly life in the humanities and the way in which that life is not just individual or personal, but public, and advocate and 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 a life of uh, of advocacy. So I'm going to uh, just also mention that in the spring, our group will be hosting two more lectures, one by Andromache Karanika uh, of Irvine, and another by our own Paige Dubois, and we will be scheduling those very shortly. I hope, and um, we will be announcing the schedule of those presentations as well. So Edith, I am going to turn it over to you now and uh, invite you to share with us your experience. Uh, oh, thank you. For, Anna Marie has given us Edith Hall's website on the chat. So Edith, please take it. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen. So can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can. And you can see me? Yes, we can. Okay, well, thank you so very, very much, Seth, for um, inviting me. I got to know Seth intellectually when I was writing about um, Aesop, which was actually also a time when I was reading a lot of Paige Du Bois, who sussed Aesop in a way nobody else has, as far as I'm concerned. She knows I think that, <laughs> uh, but when I was, trying to think about how uh, children get involved with Greek and Roman authors and about the extraordinary world saturation in Aesop. I found Seth's work on um, children's literature incredibly stimulating. Um, the subtitle here, the title is Negotiating Class and Gender with Classics in the Real World and in the Academy, which is what I was asked to talk about. I, 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 and I have never, ever been asked to talk about my life before. And it, it, it's, it's quite embarrassing for an English person, especially English females who are fed on modesty and, 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 and uh, 
all the rest of it. But actually, as I put the PowerPoint together this morning, the trip down memory lane was quite something. Um, an awful lot of this is actually about my father. <laughs> I just talked to Seth about that. I will done one day write the memoir. My father is 93. He's in a Scottish care home and he's just recovered from COVID. None of us thought he was going to recover from COVID. It's been an awful winter, but he has recovered. Um, he was both my inspiration and my bane. And um, I can't write the memoir while he's still alive on the planet. But practically everything about me does come from having been the rebellious daughter of a very strict Calvinist Church of England vicar. Okay, that, that, is, that is the bottom line about everything. So we all have to negotiate in the academy, uh, a professional career in humanities and in the real world with whoever we are actually. And I think things have got a lot rougher than since when I was a graduate student in the 1980s because the, the career path is much harder to find. The humanities are much more under attack. And even our very own subject as classics is, is, is not under attack, but is being uh, much discussed uh, quite rightly, especially by um, uh, African-American and in Britain, BAME community classicists. So it's never been more important than to get our, our brains clear about what we're doing if we want to teach and research the ancient Greek and Roman worlds. Um, let me see if I can figure out how to get onto the next slide. Oh, I see. I just do it in my mouse. All right. So very simply, and I, I've even managed to dig out, there are only about three pictures of me as a child, but I have actually put one up here, which is me at the age of eight when I got my first cat, who was called I, Laura. And I remember my father saying that is Greek for twisty tail. A cat in ancient Greek is I, Lauros, because he was a New Testament expert and he knew Greek, which is why I knew Greek. But when people said to me in the 1990s, I had a couple of female graduate students who actually said to me that being a feminist is just horrible old hat. I think things have really improved here, by the way. But in the 1990s, being called, uh, you, describing yourself as a feminist, certainly in Britain, got to be pretty criticized actually by some of the young women. Boring old stuff, we've got our rights. What are you talking about? Stop yammering on, right? Um, actually, one of them has recent, one of those who said all that, who's now in her mid 40s, has apologized to me because she's now a raving feminist that uh, she, she, she got married and changed her name and couldn't understand what the problem was. But I just found it very interesting putting this out because this is, this is my young life. So I'm born in 1959. When I'm eight years old, and I remember it vividly, the world changed. This is British law, okay? I know things are a bit different in the States, and also you have a federal system and a state system, all the rest of it. This is British law. I so vividly remember 1967 and the discussions when I was eight with that cat between my parents about the Abortion Act, which legalized abortion under certain circumstances and homosexuality under certain circumstances for people over 21. Male homosexuality, nobody ever ever notices female homosexuality in the law, of course. And my mother, who was an old-fashioned Scottish liberal, middle-class liberal, supported these things. My father was a working class, very working class, Christian, thought they were hideous. It wasn't until 1970 that we had the Equal Pay Act. And I remember this vividly, I was 11. And there've been movies about it now, but Barbara Castle was, was, was you know, it, it was a huge thing. And I remember just deeply wondering why not women haven't had equal pay before that and could be paid half of men were. It wasn't until 1973, when I was about 13, 14, women were allowed to join the stock exchange. Weird, but important, because it was about control of money. 1974, I was 14, 15, beginning to think about where to go to university. Now, before then, Oxford and Cambridge, anyway, had hardly any places for women, because almost all the colleges were only for men. 
there were only a couple of colleges for women. And the so-called Jesus plan began to make it possible for a girl to imagine getting into Oxford. All right. So I, I did start imagining getting into it. There was still only about one in five places for women, but it was far, far easier than before 1974. 1975, finally a woman could have a baby and still have her job the day after, right? She could not, you know, I was, I was 16. I was fertile. Um, and I was reading things by now, the big books were coming out like Germain Greer, The Female Eunuch, uh, Against Our Will, the, the, these sorts of absolute classics of second wave feminism. 1975, and I remember this vividly, because my father was very angry that my mother was allowed to buy something on credit without his under signature. All right, that was when I was 16 years old. I can see Paige nodding away here. <laughs> um, I got seriously interested in gay rights as an undergraduate because I was heavily involved in theater when all, all the men were gay <laughs> and a lot of them got ill. And it was 1982 that AIDS was identified in Europe. I mean, I was an accidental supporter of gay rights. I'm not gay, uh, and nor was anybody close to me in my family. But because I was into theatre so much, many, many of my friends were. But it wasn't until 1991 that the Foreign Office allowed gay men, um, again, women had never counted, but male homosexuals were allowed to work for the, for the Foreign Office. And I already, by that stage, had two friends in the Foreign Office, one of whom John Kitmer later became British ambassador to Greece. Um, very frustrated because they could not be openly gay while working in what was considered a sort of security risk zone. Rape with an app, marriage did not even get noticed till 1992. Um, I had very stupidly got married in 1987 <laughs> to somebody who I, I, I left in 1989, <laughs> but I was very, very aware um, that you still could not go to the police and complain that you had had to have sex when you didn't want to, if you were actually married to the person. And for me, because of my father, actually the one that had me weeping in front of the television, despite the fact that I'm a raving atheist, was the first women to be ordained in the Church of England in 1994. I, I, I cried my eyes out and I was trying to, at the time to think why, but it was because I'd had a childhood where I was constantly told I was completely impure, uh, could not be uh, administered the Eucharist, could not even sing in the church choir because girls' voices are somehow not pure enough. And that to me still was actually the day when I kind of thought, my father has been shown publicly to be wrong. <laughs> okay. So when girls ask me why I'm a feminist, that's it. Okay. And it was quite interesting to put the dates together. Race is a, a different issue. So my parents got a TV in 1966. <laughs> I remember it. My father was a vicar um, and he got a TV so that the entire parish could come and watch the World Cup final that Britain. England won the World Cup 1966. But my most devastating memory is that very moment in 1968 at the Olympics. I remember this vividly. I was watching the television with my family and my mother muttered, they're communists, okay? I remember this so vividly. And I said, mummy, what's a communist? And my father said, an evil man who wants to take over the world. Okay, I immediately thought communism sounds really interesting <laughs> and developed a, 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 an abiding interest in what was going on in the Soviet Union, um, just because I was nine and curious. But at the same time, and this has became very important to my doctorate, I mean, uh, 200 men were hanged and women, but mostly men in Pretoria Central Prison between the early 1960s and 1989 uh, by the apartheid regime. And this came to pierce me. And I have to say, complexity, that my father was the first out on the streets when it came to apartheid, right? Not women, <laughs> nothing, but 
when it came to apartheid, he absolutely was out there, right? And, and, and taught me anti-racism, I must say this, very, very young. And I was painfully aware of the whole South African situation, wrote my entire doctorate, Inventing the Barbarian, is about apartheid. People may not know that, but it was, it was written in the 1980s before Mandela was released from prison. But Stephen Lawrence was murdered in 1993 in Britain. And that particular case has had extraordinarily long standing reverberations. The police were hugely corrupt in covering up what had happened. You know, it, 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 that was really late. That's already the 1990s, but it had a huge impact on me. I know this all sounds really heavy, but it's actually just the truth. When it came to class, I knew something was odd about class because my father, his father was one of 12 children. We went to all their houses. They all lived in very scruffy little council houses, some of them without toilets. My father had completely transcended this. He'd gone to Oxford, he'd become a vicar. He'd um, joined the middle class very thoroughly, but his entire family had not. And do you know what? I was very struck about how happy a lot of them were. This is not just a story of misery. My mother's family were middle-class Scots people and they were completely miserable and they all committed suicide and were heavily depressed. And my father's working class family were much more joyous. I, I, I can't really, they were much more magical. They were much more vivid to me. I'm not trying to romanticize it, but they felt much more real to me. And I was actually very close to my paternal grandfather who was an ex minor and so on. Although I am no way working class in any conceivable way, I was brought up with half my family very much in that environment. But the blinding experience was when I was an undergraduate, the summer of 1980 to one, uh, the only job I could get for money was at the local mental hospital. And I worked in the laundry that was the only job on offer at the job center and I needed to get money. It's now been closed. It was a, a derangedly appalling place. Um, the work in the laundry was almost done for, almost all done for free by inmates with low mental capacity. It really was like one flew over the cuckoo's nest, it, uh, uh, only worse in atmosphere because it wasn't as exciting personalities. And I worked on those steam machines and crippling burns and broken bones were a daily incidence but that people who were suffering them were mentally of the age of five they had no union representation they had no pay I, I simply couldn't believe it and I joined what was then the union for people in the NHS the National Health Service called NUPI National Union of Public Employees and became in two weeks the spokesperson of the union, and uh, because I could not believe what was going on. I, mean, I simply couldn't believe it. I remember that we worked for 48 hour weeks, but we had to queue our one our lunch hour to get our pay. The one hour you got not on your feet. And I, it, it was like the scales falling from my eyes. And I'm afraid I came, you know, bright red class warrior uh, instantly, right? Everybody should have to do a job scraping shit off sheets in a mental hospital laundry. They really should. Because if everybody did that, they would all, all believe in universal income. Full stop, end of, no doubts. So then I go to Oxford, I managed to find one photograph, which I have to show you because of the hairdo. <laughs> do, you like my, do you like my 80s hairdo? <laughs> so I, that's the only photograph I found. And it was actually, the, would you believe the publicity photograph? Because I starred as Lysis Strata in the Oxford University Greek play. And I loved it because I dressed up, and I wish I got a photograph, but I dressed up as a Palestinian uh, freedom fighter. Uh, I was told to by my director, who's actually quite a famous Hellenist called Ian Rutherford, <laughs> who edits Pindar's P.S. <laughs> but while I was an undergraduate, I had been, since 13, I, I lost all my religion at 13. I hated my father, I hated patriarchy. Um, but I was saved after seven years of sleeping around and drink and drugs, literally from 13 to 21. Seriously, it's slightly surprising I'm, I, I'm, I survived that. I should not have been alive. It was that bad. I was saved by Aristotle. I was put on to read Aristotle. This sentence in the Nicomachean Ethics 
Well, I actually can't read it because all your faces is, oh, there we are, I can move it out. This sentence is what changed my life. Where we are free to act, we're also free to refrain from acting. Where we're able to say no, we are also able to say yes. If therefore we are responsible for doing a thing when to do it is right, we are also responsible for not doing it when not to do it is wrong. Now that might sound very pie, but it was when I read this, I realized it wasn't enough to keep your nose clean. And that is what almost all our politicians and our leaders and our heads of faculty and our mentors do is they think if they can not avoid, if they can avoid saying something racist or avoid saying something wrong, then they can go to bed. Well, that's not how I see it. I actually see it as if I've had my life and I haven't used it to try and actually do something active, this commission, omission distinction does inform my daily life. And so when I'm assessing politicians, it's not good enough for me that they've managed to keep their nose clean. When I'm assessing someone who wants to be head of a university, I want to know what they've done for poverty charities. You know, when have they stuck their neck out to actually do something? It's not, negative is not good enough. And if you start doing that, then very surprising things happen. So if you go on, for example, the British Royal Family's website, they have to publish all the charities that they, um, are advocates for. The Queen of England, who everybody says is wonderful, is advocate for uh, over 600 charities. You know, she's patron. Are any of them poverty charities? No. They are regimental and private school charities, right? She could easily have picked a few progressive charities to be patron of, or, or at least anti-poverty. Do you know who the only royal is who supports anti-poverty charities? That's Camilla, would you believe? Camilla actually is really good on poverty and old age, and um, save the children fund and things like that. So it gives, gave me a new way to assess people. Now, in later life, all that turned up in the book I wrote about Aristotle. I am a practicing Aristotelian. I know what he said about slavery and women. I know all too well what he said about slavery and women, but his practical ethics, his practical virtue ethics saved my life at 21 without any doubt whatsoever. When I graduated, I actually went off to work for a shipping company. I was heavily in debt. I always had a great taste in, I'm afraid, champagne socialism. <laughs> uh, I love pleasure. Um, and I just thought I had to go off and work for money. And I took a job as a graduate trainee with a shipping company. Um, and they was, I was the first female, it was called Ocean Transport and Trading. And the only, um, I had no intention of being academic at all. The only, um, I'd been quite miserable at, at Oxford as an undergraduate for all kinds of reasons, including the fact it's fully of ridiculous private school toffs and Etonians. That was basically the reason why I couldn't stand it. But I went off and the shipping company actually hired me because I spoke modern Greek, which is another story. OK, I, I happen to speak good Greek. And they thought I could go off and buy tugboats in the Piraeus, which I could. But they actually decided, teehee, we've got a girl, to send me to run the uh, very militant tugboatmen of Cardiff and Liverpool. <laughs> I spent a year in the docks of Cardiff and Liverpool realising that my tugboatmen were always right and my management was always wrong and I was supposed to be management, right? Unbelievable. I, I came across a file. Um, I was supposed to be figuring out how to um, cut back the numbers, rationalise. And I came across in, that's actually Cardiff docks. I worked in that grey building. But in Liverpool docks, I came across this cabinet of files detailing the compensation, ha-ha, that had been given to the widows of tugboatmen who died in drowning and other accidents in the 1950s. And do you know what? They were given sort of two shillings, which now is worth 20 pence in order to pay for the funeral and, and, and get a day out. I mean, I couldn't believe it. It was just like this rolling education in the class politics of Britain. And I, I left, I, I couldn't stand it. I didn't know what to do with my life. Um, 
And I left even though I'd had a massive row actually in the Cardiff docks, because these 36, I remember it vividly, tugboatmen who were highly articulate, had been quite rightly campaigning for proper air protection when they were in the engine rooms. And I was supposed to be bashing them in and stopping the strikes and saying that they didn't need ear protectors. Simple as that. But I got very angry with them because they didn't like having a woman manager. And one day they put up all these page three girls. Page three meant the girls with no, the, 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 the topless models in, in the sun newspaper. So nipples everywhere all over. The, and they did this just to rattle me. So I went off and I thought long and hard and thought, what would Aristotle do? <laughs> And I just went in and I put up a lot of gay porn up on the other wall, right? I didn't take the women down. I put all these naked boys up um, and they were outraged, absolutely outraged. But the row we had meant I had to leave because I conceded they were right on all the class politics. If they conceded I was right, that the nipples had to come down. And then I actually got married to this Greek American who was from Connecticut, very, very, very rich Greek American, Kantian. He was doing his doctorate on Kant at Oxford. That's the only reason I went back to Oxford because I was actually miserable as Oxford as an undergraduate, but I did go back. But a, the miners' strike happened in my very first year, and I was very politically active and was spending the entire time on Corn Market Street ducking whenever Professor Hugh Lloyd-Jones, who was my supervisor, <laughs> walked past. <laughs> I had to duck under the table because I was collecting for the miners. And, 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 so, and it was very, very extreme. It was all very, very extreme that I had one life. I was the Oxford person who was collecting the food for our pit, which was Mardi Colliery in, in the Rhonda in South Wales. And uh, I was... I was quite important, uh, I was quite a significant figure in that Oxford campaign, but I was so craven that Hugh Lloyd-Jones would find out and not write me a reference. Of course he found out anyway, and that happened anyway, but, 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 but anyway, I'm still embarrassed. But the minor strike did have an amazing impact on me, in particular the debates actually between the English and the Scottish leadership, because the English leadership was, now I'm going to get technical comrades, Trotskyite. OK, the English leader, Scargill was a Trotskyite and Scargill believed the pits had to stay open at all costs. It was all very macho. The Scottish miners were led by a communist called Mick Maguire, who was far more intelligent. And he said, the argument is not about the pits. The pits is a terrible job and it's highly polluting. It's about the right to work. And it's the right to respect for our communities and decent alternative employment right, and universal incomes. And that was hugely developmental in my mind as to the differences on, on the left as to where I stood, that I wasn't campaigning to keep the pits open, but the basic principle that you cannot make two million people redundant, right? <laughs> Just like that. Um, and then in 1989, when I just finished my doctorate, the other thing that really shook anybody interested in class politics to the core in Britain. I'm sure you had equivalents in the USA, but the Hillsborough Stadium disaster. And I had a particular, I was brought up in Nottingham and it was Nottingham Forest was playing away at Leicester, uh, Sheffield. And it wasn't so much that 96 young people died as a result of police negligence, which they did. They were incredibly young. The ones who died were most of them 14, 15, because the bigger guys like that in the picture got out. But that the now 30 year campaign of secrecy by the judiciary and the police to blame them and say they were drunken rioters when they were mainly children and use every single stereotype against the Liverpool working class has been a constant emotional thorn in, in, in my side. So now I'm going to just try and say, um, when I was um, a graduate student, I did join the Communist Party of Great Britain. Um, it's difficult to talk about this to an American audience and indeed to ones in the former communist states, 
But the Communist Party of Great Britain was by that time uh, a Gramsciite Euro Communist Party. Um, and that was what I signed up to. Its manifesto was feminist and anti-racist as well as uh, anti-classist. But I did get incredibly interested in um, Eastern Europe, um, mainly as a classicist. And I had a lot of friends that I corresponded with in the Soviet Union, in Georgia, um, in Crimea, which was then Ukraine, um, and in uh, Bulgaria and Romania. And I had a lot of correspondence and I got very interested in the fact that in Sebastopol, in Crimea, which is right there, which is Torike Kosonisos, this is where everybody's a and and Taurus is set, <laughs> that they have a theatre. There is a Greek theatre, it's the northernmost Greek theatre ever discovered. And so I, I developed a very profound interest in the archaeology of the Black Sea, which last year I published a book on with David Braund and Rosie Wiles on um, that. So that, that was a continuing interest that I felt that the whole Greek and Roman worlds weren't being properly understood. All the slave markets were in the Black Sea. All the slave trade came, came through the Black Sea and the Hellespont. Um, and because all the scholarship about it was in Eastern European languages. Nobody in the West could read it. And in fact, I was certainly the first person to sort of set, to, to, to connect a Fijinara and Taurus with the Crimea. I mean, it, it, it was just incredible. And I was writing to Soviet and Ukrainian archeologists about it. I had none of the languages, but um, they, I was writing to them. They were ordinary people. They were demons, they were devils, they had fantastic research, they were doing really interesting things, they were humans and of course as soon as the war came down in 1989 I started to go there and you know, invite them over to Britain and it's been a very important uh, part of my life but this is a little girl who just to annoy her father because of the communist conversation in 1968 I used my pocket money to get a thing called Soviet Weekly coming through the vicarage door just to annoy him. <laughs> And Soviet Weekly was this total propaganda thing. It was all about all the farming collectives that had achieved there. But I was just fascinated by this other world. And um, it did really annoy my father. I can tell you, he went to the post office and said that I had to go and collect Soviet Weekly. I was 10 years old. I had to go and collect Soviet Weekly from the post office. I wasn't allowed to have it coming through the door of the vicarage, but there you go. Anyway, ethnicity ended up in Inventing the Barbarian, which is my doctoral thesis written in the 1980s, which is both about apartheid psychologically, but also very much about, do you remember, well, Paige and Seth will, I don't know if anyone else will. Uh, do you remember all the propaganda wars? So things like queues in the Soviet Union, you know, queuing for food were up there. Um, but was over in the Soviet Union, it was like shots of junkies on the streets of New York injecting themselves. I mean, there was this totally structuralist war of the other and self-definition going on. That has all changed since the fall of the, the war. I would have written Inventing the Barbarian very differently with the post 9-11 international situation. And that's what I try to explain to people is that that whole definition by the other was very much about US and USSR propaganda. So actually the syringe is a really interesting one because for in American propaganda, the syringe was middle-class intellectuals being injected with drugs to shut them up and take them to mental hospital. But the syringe was equally important in Soviet propaganda because it was the junkies and prostitutes on the streets of New York, right? But the syringe became this othering symbol, which helped me decode a lot of how the Athenians talked about the Persians, um, all kinds of different ways. And that's carried through to editing the Persians and cultural responses to the Persian Wars. I haven't actually done a lot on gender. I tried to avoid it because I sensed a ghettoization, believe it or not. Um, but when I was at Oxford uh, as an undergraduate, 78 to 82, I've, we were given a list of things we weren't allowed to read. Um, 
George Thompson, who was, who was, who was a communist, he's still a scholar. Um, Paige would have been honest if they'd heard of her. <laughs> but prime suspect was Froma Zeitlin, right? And we were told not to read Froma Zeitlin because it was feminist gobbledygook. That's the actual phrase. Feminist gobbledygook. So, of course, I immediately went off and found her article on the Oristia and, and, and all the rest of it. Uh, Helena Foley, we weren't allowed to read, Reflections of Women in Antiquity. So everything that was on the list, do not read, I went and read, okay? Later that came, I didn't really, haven't done much work. There's a couple of articles on the actual cast of Athens, but I have not specialised in writing about gender. Uh, what I did do, and I was annoyed at having to do it, it's astonished me that by 2013, nobody had done women classical scholars, just a history. They'd done women archeologists and women scientists and women astronomers, but nobody had done that. So with a wonderful PhD student of mine, former Rosie Wiles, we finally got it together and had a conference, but it's only got dead women in. They had to have been dead by 2000, uh, 1913. So the next book of all the great feminists still alive today, awaits to be written. We ended with Jacqueline de Romilly, who died in 1913. But it was an attempt to say, look, there are all, all these foremothers. So I realized by that time, it wasn't just about doing feminist things with Greek and Roman texts, but that we need a genealogy. We need the pictures of all these smiling, beautiful women up on the walls alongside all those boring old male clerics. The one article I am very proud of is coming out next year in, uh, Ronnie Ancona and George Suvala's New Directions in the Study of Women in the Greco Roman World. It's just an article. But that is a festrif for Sarah B. Pomeroy, whose book, well, Goddesses, Whores, Wives, and Slaves, got us all on the road of women's history. And I've written an article on Euripides Hippolytus explaining exactly why I hate it so much as the foundation text of false rape accusations. I absolutely hate that play. I hate its status as an masterpiece. I speak as somebody who loves the poetry, but hates the ideology. And my why we really have to think twice about the Hippolytus is in that, uh, that book. And I have to say that Paige and Froma and Helena have all been so fundamental to me thinking about the way myth authorizes patriarchy as well as everything else. It's the authorization argument that has made such an impact on me. So I decided to self-educate. I made two very good friends in the early 21st century. One was for Rosa Vizunia, who was at a California university and is the great expert on colonial India and the classics. Um, and the other was Patrice Rankine, who wrote his stunning book. He's now um, Dean of Arts at a university in Virginia, Richmond University. He wrote a tremendous book called Ulysses Black about Ralph Waldo Ellison. And so in 2007, it was the anniversary both of the abolition of the Slave Trade Act in Britain in 1807. It wasn't the abolition of slavery, but it was a big start. It was the abolition of the slave trade in the British colonies. It was also the anniversary of Indian independence. So I had decided by that stage, I just had to educate myself in a way that we had never got educated in British schools about the British empire. It was simple as that. I went on a long, long road and ran a big conference on slavery and a big conference on um, reception of classics in the Raj, and these three books arose out of that. But actually, and this I think is a point in terms of talking to the young, I didn't know about them. I decided I needed education. I taught myself everything I know about British imperialism between 2000 and 2005 in order to run those conferences. I did not know about them and it was horrifying. But a very good way of developing your classics is to pick a period of reception that you don't know about and go educate yourself in it because you'll both educate yourself in modern history or a modern genre or a modern medium whatever it is you choose 
and begin to get a very strong idea about the instrumentality of Greeks and Romans, both in oppressive practices, um, and I'm very glad that they are under the spotlight and I have tried to do my bit to bring them, but also just as importantly, and this is what the only thing I really urgently say to my very good friend, Anel Padilla Peralta and others, is the incredible role that Greek and Roman texts have played in enlightenment causes as well. We need that dialectic. And, and, and I try very hard to listen to people, radicals of the past, just as much as uh, oppressive people in the past. And that was what we really tried to do in ancient slavery and abolition. Class is the last frontier in Britain. I know it's very different in America. Everything is different in America. Money is more important and race is more important relative to class. I know that. But in Britain, it is still absolutely crippling. So only 7% of our children go to private school. It's very, very, very expensive. If you look at the proportions of people in any positions of executive power, not only in government, but across all the industries, across all the professions, the 7% who go to private school are still so unbelievably privileged in every single way, including an in access to Latin and Greek. So nobody likes these books, certainly in Britain. Actually, they're getting better press in America. People's History of Classics has had terribly uh, sniffy reviews. I'm unbelievably proud of it. It is 200,000 words that I and Henry Stead, my great comrade at St Andrews University, we've gone to every workers' library in Britain to sort out what working class people were and weren't getting access to from 1689 onwards. Uh, it's an absolute stonker. It's my life's work. I'm not quite sure what to do in the morning, actually, now I get out of bed. I've been collecting that stuff since 1984. Um, there's also another book, the uh, reform book and a big website. You can go on and find out a lot. But every single miner I found who was quietly reading Plato's Republic in English, it's always in English, or Plutarch's Lives or Epictetus or Livy on the Roman Republic, whatever it is, uh, gives me one more foremother or forefather that isn't an Etonian, <laughs> okay? And I think we need this rousing backstory of how great our subject can be. Um, now those stories intertwine with anti-racism in all kinds of ways and with feminism. But I, I, I am unashamedly written a book about the British white working class and good on them, you know, and, and things are getting much worse for them right now with COVID. The differential between how salaried professionals and the working class have suffered over the last year is staggering, right? I've actually saved loads of money because I got a salary, right? I'm hardly the richest of the rich, but it's all there. Very important to my life has been my friendship with Tony Harrison, um, who is a classicist. He did classics at Leeds University, he started an academic career from a very, very rough area of Leeds. Um, he's now in his eighties, he's got Alzheimer's. He's my best friend. Um, and I've edited his prose works by his request, edited his Vestrif, New Light on Heritage, and just had out a, my new book, Tony Harrison, Poet of Radical Classicism. He does in poetry and theatre what I've tried to do in academic books. Uh, he is a sort of soulmate. And please go and read some poems by Tony Harrison. <laughs> And finally, um, I suppose I have tried very hard with outreach. I write a blog which has got me into some trouble because I've been read about the royal family. Um, I write about race. Last one was on attempts in Honduras, not only to outlaw abortion altogether now, but to pass it in a way that means the law can never be touched again. Did you know they can do that in Honduras if they get enough votes? So that not only will no woman ever be able to have an abortion even if she's been raped and it's incest and she's two 
or the baby's got 24 heads, but ever again, they will not be allowed to touch it, right? Now, Aristotle will be turning in his grave because he always said we have to revise the constitution all the time with new data. I've just started, I've decided to put all the lectures I've ever given online free. My dear husband is, is quite good with the cameras, so we're doing that, just a people's history channel. I'm not expecting anyone to watch it, and that's an appalling lockdown hairdo, as you can see, can't get to the hairdresser. But um, I've given about a thousand lectures over the last 30 years. If anybody wants to watch them, I'm just gonna do it now till I die. They're gonna be free up there, completely free. Anybody in the world who wants to watch them. Um, that could be an ego trip, but I also just think, why not? I've only done three so far, but <laughs> I will get there, especially when I retire. I do a lot of work with the Workers' Educational Association. Latest one was a whole day course on Homer. I do that gratis. People from all over Britain can just go online and you get a day's course on Homer. The Workers' Educational Association was an, originally a very, very proud organization set up in the early years of the 20th century. It's still a very proud organization. Um, actually, it's one that the internet has really helped because people don't have to travel to go to courses anymore. So I just do that gratis. A lot of weekends, I'll just give a course uh, as long as people want them. And I do a lot of work with University of the Third Age now. I've always had a lot of part-time graduate students. It's the one way that people can do a PhD and afford to. For a very long time, one of the reasons I left Oxford, which is another thing we can talk about, but one of the reasons I left Oxford was you couldn't do a part-time PhD there. And if you can do a part-time one, then you can often afford the fees while you're doing a working job. So I've got a lot of quite elderly people through. There's Caroline Latham, who was 72, wonderful woman, uh, when she got her marvellous doctorate, which was on meter in Greek tragedy. Brilliant metrician. Um, love her to pieces. So I've done, I've got a whole series of quite, elderly <laughs> PhD students and my free Greek class, which actually isn't just meant to be for OAPs, but actually it's all old age pensioners who come on and there, that's the picture they gave me for Christmas after we'd read the Fido and the Medea. Um, I was so happy they, they painted themselves all into this picture and we meet up once a week and at the moment we're reading Thucydides, uh, which is very hard, but we're just reading all of Thucydides. They're mostly London old age pensioners. Every Tuesday, 6.15, it's only an hour and a half. Do you know what? It's highlight of my week. I love it. I just love these people. And I'm ashamed to say they send me crates of red wine. I won't take any pay, but I do like the wine. <laughs> so, and finally, ACE. Um, this is a campaign I set up about five years ago. And you said Latin and Greek in state school, Seth. That's not quite right. The point this is a very British thing but Latin and Greek are only really available now in the private sector that's the seven percent of children whose parents can afford fees and it's used to reinforce and perpetuate privilege because those guys with their Latin and Greek exams at 18 A levels pretty much walk straight into Oxbridge okay because everybody wants a student with Latin and Greek the 93%, like my own kids were at state school, there is hard, there's no Greek and there's hardly any Latin, only a couple of hundred a year nationally. But there are these excellent subjects called classical civilization and ancient history. And in Britain, these can be taught, the technical differences, these can be taught by a teacher not qualified in classics. It could be a history teacher, an English teacher, a philosophy teacher. I've even got a physics teacher. If I can find, just a qualified secondary school, that's high school teacher, in every school at state school in Britain, willing to persuade to teach Greek and Roman civilization and ancient history, they can bring it in. And we've had amazing success since I set up this campaign. Um, you know, we've introduced classical civilization or ancient history into dozens of state schools. 
And it's all about personal relationships with the secondary school teachers, which I do a lot of. And it's really easy because they're so fucking, sorry, they're so freaking admirable. They are so much more hardworking than most academics. I love them. I'm very good friends with high school teachers and we need a much more joined up educational system where secondary and tertiary education really talk or there will be no classics undergraduates anymore. You know, there won't. I haven't talked about how I feel about the current critiques of classics as a discipline because I, I can, but I still believe that the things written in Latin and Greek are unbelievably worth reading and can be unbelievably important for citizenship and for enlightenment. And I'm not going to apologize because they've been the curriculum of empire because they can also be the curriculum of liberation provided we teach them alongside Gilgamesh and ancient Egyptian literature and ancient Persian literature and indeed um, ancient Scythian or Gaulish or the stuff that Belgians are writing on Hadrian's Wall in Britain. But I am not going to apologize for being a classics teacher because there's a way you can do it. It's the way that Paige, who's been one of my role models, has always done it. And I'm not going to apologize for being a classicist. I'm just going to be a radical classicist and hope that we can encourage a new generation to do so as well. Thank you, Edith. Thank you so much. I hope you will agree with me that that presentation is the definition of kick-ass scholarship. <laughs> I think that you've given us so much to think about and so much to work on. And I hope that many of us will stay through. Um, I'm going to moderate the Q&A and Paige has her blue hand up already. And I'm going to ask, um, I'm gonna ask Paige to lead us off then. Well, first of all, just thank you. That was incredible. It was so inspiring and invigorating and you are just such an amazing force in our field. I really, really appreciate your energy and your worldwide efforts. It's, it's really inspiring. So I just, I, I just wanna ask you, um, because this has, it connects with my sense of what I've been up to all this time. There is a certain rage. There is yeah. anger in what you have proposed to us and what you've done and what you've accomplished all these years in this amazing body of work. But there's also, and this is part of what I love so much, an investment in pleasure, in the champagne. Yeah. And I just, admire that so much because I think there's a kind of dourness in the field of classics, <laughs> which is so killing. And, yeah. you know, I, I interested in what you say about your father, but um, I just wonder how you synthesize those because um, is it Aristotle who allows you to yeah. put together the rage and the delight because um, yeah. I don't see Definitely. that in Aristotle at all. I see, you know, this kind of prescriptive, nothing no, in no, no. sort of <laughs> ideology. And I know you read him very differently, but I just want you to talk about that a little bit. Oh, okay. Now, pleasure is, is, is incredibly important. Uh, I, before Aristotle, well, how would I put it? Actually, there is a, a, an Aristotelian way in, and, and it is through the poetics. So Plato lays down the gauntlet in the Republic and says, we just can't have all these namby-pamby theatre people and poets in here with all the stories about naughty gods and, 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 and weeping men and, and effeminate men and sexy women. And Yeah, that's an approximate paraphrase of Plato. <laughs> but two, two, three, three, okay, <laughs> Republic. And I sort of, and he says, but if somebody, one of you, to his students, he says it to his students, can come along with a prose justification of why we should have this poetry in the Republic that shows it is both Ophelimon, useful to the polis, and hairdo, right, <laughs> pleasurable. If you can show that it's both, I will, I will hear you. And blow me down, 
Aristotle goes off and he writes chapter six of the Poetics. <laughs> and he says, humans get enormous pleasure out of imitation, huge pleasure. They love it. Little children love to do it. And the way that we can learn about painful things, which is useful, like dead bodies and disgusting animals. And he says dead bodies in a pleasurable way that is good for us is to do it through art. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that the profundity of that, that we can have both these two tenets of, of uh, and I've got up on my, my own website, I have Aesop with this thing that says Utile and Dulce. There is no point in studying anything that is not fun. Why would anyone do that? Why, why would you do that? I mean, why would you go to university and do something that made you miserable? So the joy of classics to me is that it is absolutely both, okay? When it comes to Aristotle's ethics, well, I, I just need a, I need a couple of days with you, Paige. But to me, the liberating thing totally was that having been brought up in, in, in what I now know was actually a decidedly Platonist Christianity, where body bad, woman bad, flesh bad, real world bad, male good, mind good, cerebral good, uh, spirit good, ideal world good, immortality good, um, passion bad, emotion bad, sex bad. <laughs> and growing up as a highly emotional, very passionate, highly sexed, <laughs> fun-loving uh, party girl in my teens, utterly desolate because I could no longer see a single reason to try to be virtuous once I'd given up on Christianity when capitalism is telling you that nice guys finish last right I mean I had seven years of like why be good why be nice person there is no reason to be a nice person if there is no providential deity or life after death is there any reason whatsoever to be a nice person in a capitalist world of course not so when I discovered that you could have an emotional spectrum that wasn't passion good, reason bad, but a right amount of anger, a right amount of sex, a right amount of pleasure, a right amount of um, envy, a right amount of whatever it was, an excess is bad, but people who haven't got it are actually morally stunted. You can't be angry if you can't feel sexual desire, if you can't feel envy, if you don't like pleasure, right? So for me, learning that my body was absolutely fine, I just needed not to do things at the wrong time, the wrong place until excess. <laughs> uh <-huh>. my, anger, <laughs> my anger was absolutely fine, provided I used it to get my child who's been bullied into the headmaster's office to get redress rather than taking it out on the whole world and beating everybody up, right? If I used it for good causes. So to me, Aristotle's Meson was a total lifesaver. And actually, funnily enough, Malcolm Schofield, this is the last thing I'll say, who's, who's a very brilliant Aristotelian and very, very calm gentleman, indeed, <laughs> at, at Cambridge, said he couldn't believe I was an Aristotelian because he'd always seen me as so vivid. And I said, that's exactly the point, Malcolm. I'm the one who needed it, right? I needed to be allowed all my emotions, passions, instincts, but to figure out how to regulate them rather than just being told I was a filthy, dirty, <laughs> emotional, angry, fierce woman. It was, it was utterly liberating. Does that give you a short answer? Yes, to one when thank I'm... you. Just keep being loud. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Are there other questions? Stacy has a question. Hi, Stacey. Hi, um, Professor Hall. Thank you so much. I, I guess I just wanted to react uh, to the to the talk and maybe pose a quick question at the end of a couple of um, comments. But I, I really enjoyed this so much, and um, you know, I, I think it's you've already given us so many answers to this question we've been thinking about about how to keep the classics. Um, alive and surviving and answering our um, most urgent questions. But it's, um, 
it was so interesting to me to be at a at a classics lecture and writing down that women women were allowed to join the stock exchange in 1973. <laughs> I, <laughs> that's just such an interesting thing to to put next to one another. Um, but I guess I was um, 14. Of course, I noticed. No, I was 14. <laughs> I mean, I think um, your point about um, everyone washing the sheets, I feel that way about um, K-12 education. I absolutely think right. that professors should should have to teach kids regularly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And anyway, we could talk about this some other time. But I'm just curious, since you gave us um, so much from your own life, uh, which, again, I think is such a great model for scholarship. Um, is there a life from your classical studies that um, you find particularly charming or inspiring um, an individual, either um, fictional or, um, or historical, that, that you would recommend or that you think? Oh, from, from antiquity? Yes, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sorry about this, but it's actually Aristotle. Okay. <laughs> so this, this guy... Know. He's a son of a physician in a small northern Greek town. Yeah. He loses his parents when he's 13. He's lucky enough to have uh, a brother in law. His, his, his sister's married rich. And his brother in law adopts him and sees how smart he is. Somebody recognized his potential and decides, mm -hmm. no, he's not going to go straight and be the local doctor in, in, in Sagara, he's going to Plato's Academy, right? There's only one place for this boy, right? Head, brain like this. Aristotle then spends 20 years at Plato's Academy. And although he ends up completely refuting most of Plato's system, he, he, you can tell from his writings how much he respects him and, and how much he learned. At 17 to 37, he's there. At 37, Plato died, he is not elected head of the academy, despite being by far the most brilliant student. Envy, and, and, and many of us have had to deal with not getting gongs or promotions because of other people's envy, especially, I certainly have. I, if you're a woman, you have to be five times as good, all that kind of thing. I did not want to go down that trail tonight, but, and I'm fine, I've got a job. But, so he's actually left really stumped and he goes off and he works as a tutor for a, a, a sort of tyrant king in Asia Minor for a couple of years. He figures out, goes and lives with his mate Theophrastus on Lesbos and they invent zoology and botany. Then the big call comes in, Philip of Macedon, you will come and educate my brilliant son, right? People say, why did he do that? Uh, he would have been dead. I mean, excuse me, you don't say no to Philip the one-eyed of Macedon, where everybody, you know, so he goes off. He manages to survive that court where absolutely everybody got assassinated. The minute Philip was killed and Alexander went to Asia, do you know how old he is? 49. Mm -hmm. He finally, at 49 years old, gets back to Athens, he does like the democracy, he does like his theatre, and the money he saved in Macedon, he can found the Lyceum with his best mate, Theophrastus, and he sets up the best university, first real research university with a library that does arts and sciences in the world, and in 12 years, writes everything, dies quite young at 62. I'm about to be 62. I think that as a role model for a life, is quite incredible and um, I tell everybody I know who's in their 40s and miserable <laughs> just go find your lyceum just go find your lyceum right Monty your hand is up thank you and thanks for the wonderful talk and as somebody that um specializes in Aristotle. I just wanted to thank you for that wonderful book, Aristotle's <laughs> Way, which my students love, I love, and um, it, you know, every, every, everybody needs to read. And it's, it's the greatest exhortation to Aristotle's philosophy since his own thank you. Uh, exhortation, I think. So, um, but the, um, I, I did want to actually hear your reaction to some of these more recent 
pieces because I'm I'm getting sort of increasingly disturbed day by day yeah. as to as to what's yeah. happening. And I'm I'm not actually um I mean I'm 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 in a department of, of philosophy and that's sort of my yeah. identity, but I, I care a lot about classics and I've learned a lot about classics and I encourage all of my students to study classics and a, a, a lot of the what, what I see is them getting really disheartened by uh, yeah. these sort of attacks on classics. Two days ago there was there was an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education entitled If Classics Doesn't Change, Let It Burn and it ends with saying, well, classicists like dealing with ruins anyway. So let let the I haven't read that one. Who's that one by? Uh that that's by Hannock. Oh uh, God. And so uh so I, I you you said a couple of things in the talk that I thought are are really important about this that I'd like you to expand on. I mean, the first is um and 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 this is what your whole career really has been devoted to, you know, finding liberatory messages within the classics. There's also the aspect of, of needing to study the classics in order to understand the, 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 the justifications of the oppressive structures and, and the history of how they got set up and why they were absolutely set up, how, how they are. And, and, and it seems to me that um, if we remove the ability to, to study these texts and the, and the direct studying of them, then we, we just let them let them remain and remove the main source of examining uh, what they're about. And and the final thing is, you know, you you commented how on in in um, your country it's getting to where it's basically the private sector where where Greek and Latin is taught, and you know that's ha that's happening that's here, perhaps even even more quickly. UCSD is down to being able to offer one upper division Greek. Uh, course per year, um, and uh, and so the result of this is that our working class students and our students that are transferring in from community colleges and so forth have no opportunity to study Latin or Greek. Um, you have to go to Stanford or, or UCLA in order to do that now. Really? Um, oh, that's terrible. Well, well, I mean, you, you know, we we help them as much as we can, and we run reading groups and, and individual studies and things like that. But that that's sort of where it seems to be going. And this discourse in the media lately is really uh, essentially giving license to administrative types and so forth to, as the article encourages, let it burn. So so I, 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 I hate to be dour, um, especially dour philosophers are much worse than dour Classicists, but um, but but I I I I I couldn't I, I have to hear what you think of of this recent stuff, please. It's so great to talk to you, Monty. I'm delighted to meet you physically in the well, not physically, but you know, we have corresponded. We've got through to the last round, by the way. Congratulations! I just can't wait for that and I would have I, I would have loved to well, just ask a question about that I've no but really innovative we've got project. through to the last round I didn't want to excite people but we'll hit we have got through the we're in the final okay I've asked Monty to come in on an Aristotle project with me if we get the money so I don't want to be ad feminam uh I I have pers I, I haven't read and I haven't read this article but yet Johanna Harnig. Um, I'm, ex I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly concerned um, because to me, the minute we say any kind of discourse study, study of any discourse whatsoever is out of bounds, it's to moronify ourselves. I, I, I mean, I'm, I, I find it terrifying. It's against every instinct I have. You know, I think we, Gosh, you have to be really careful. But, you know, if we stop reading Mein Kampf, we will not be able to understand the psychology of fascism when we need to understand the psychology of fascism. I'm not equating anything written in Greek or Latin to that, but some of it could equally easily be, you know, we, we must not do it. But do you know what always comes into my head here is, is, is I studied in great detail once what happened in the early years after the Russian Revolution 
1917 revolution. There was a thing called Prolet Cult. Prolet Cult was the wing of the Bolshevik party that said that we need to not read anything written under any mode of production, to use Marx's terms, that wasn't socialist. We must not contaminate our brains. And Lenin, Vladimir Ilyich was quite interested in this, right, idea that clean slate, tabula rasa, we chuck out all the toxic texts of every uh, pre-capitalist mode of, uh, pre-socialist mode of production. Yeah, you were still with me. He had a friend called Lunacharsky, who did classics at St. Petersburg and was a very good Bolshevik and loved the Greeks, read Greek brilliantly, who persuaded him personally that everything had to be read on the Bolshevik curriculum with notes saying, this is a slave mode of production. This is a feudal mode of production. <laughs> um, and he personally persuaded Lenin not to shut down all the classics departments, as well as the departments of, say, feudal literature, right, across the Soviet Union. Now, I know that talking about the Soviet Union never goes down well in the United States, but we are talking about 1918 here, all right? <laughs> and I feel like Luna Charsky. I feel like Luna Charsky. Of course, I want a world with no racism. Of course, I want. Actually, I am still, I'll even say, inspired by some of the original dreams of about America, right? The America that could be, you know? Um, of course. But if you think you're going to get there by deleting anything that's been written previously by Homo sapiens, you are so wrong. You are so, so wrong. And that is what I would say to you, Anna Harnink. Um, she has attacked my book, uh, Introducing the Ancient Greeks, for, she says, which I never say, Hellenic exceptionalism. But I honestly think that the 2000 years of stuff that the Greeks, what the Greeks wrote, is exceptional. I'm perfectly prepared to say it, right? That's not because they were biologically exceptional or because they're a superior race. It's not because of anything. It's because of a certain position they were in with 2000 city states around the Mediterranean Black Sea world in touch with more. They were more multicultural than anybody else. And they wrote exceptionally important things at the time, which brought on enlightenment. And I'm perfectly prepared to use all those words and I will, I'll go publicly head against her if necessary. Um, I don't think you know, we are just in such a baby and bathwater mode right now. We need critical reading of all the amazing things that Homo sapiens has ever written. Thank you. We have three questions lined up and I'd like to uh, just say it's Andromache, Karanika and Megan Fries and Catherine Evarkiu. So Andromache, Megan, Catherine, can we go in that order? You all sound wonderfully great. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Seth, thanks for bringing one of my heroes. It, this was a, a wonderful talk. Uh, I'm glad Monty asked the difficult question that I wanted to ask. And I want to ask another question. It's um, since you've been venturing and, you know, into modern Greece, into modern Greek, how is that, has that complicated your life and your oh. work? <laughs> oh. oh, that is a big one, actually. I, I, funnily enough, the hour before you guys, I was on video to some of my best friends who are women who are theatre makers in Cyprus. And um, I've been involved a lot with the feminist projects at the Cyprus National Theatre. So that's a quick answer. And their leading director, Magdalena Zira, was uh, a PhD student of mine. Uh, she, she did her doctorate with me. But, oh, I don't know where to start. Um, it's incredibly important to me. I found, I mean, I'm married into this Greek American family um, in Connecticut, and I learned everything I know really about living in a Greek family. In my, I spent the whole 20s, I mean, 
I, I knew this guy from 18 to to 30. Um, that's how I, that's why I learned to speak it. And I learned a lot about the export of capital from Greece to the United States. I learned a lot about uh, all kinds of very sinister politics uh, in Greece, that, that they were married in the Sassanopoulos family. So I had my own personal sort of way of uh, understanding it. Um, <laughs> It made me very angry about the way that small countries are spoken down to. I think I think I think that's the main thing. And my respect, there are two or three uh, Greek Greek scholars, Vios Lapis, Adonis Petridis, who are so brilliant and have repeatedly been snubbed one way or another. I mean, I, I encountered the racism of Northern European classical scholars. Um, Gregory Sifakis was a very good friend. Uh, he's very, very old now, but um, you know, I got to know and, and love and respect deeply a lot of uh, Greek scholars. Um, I don't really know how to describe it. I became a very active member of the British Committee for the re reunification of the Parthenon marbles, but not for nationalist reasons. Um, and I'm, I'm a big spokesperson for that. I think that it's just made me a much better human. It's, it's, it's hugely broadened my um, understanding. It's a very, you've given me such a good question there because it has had a huge impact, which I've never been asked to define before, okay? In terms of realizing that these amazing texts are no individual, language is property. Actually knowing the people who are the linguistic descendants has been a very important part of that for me. Um, and I know that all the good Greeks I know, and there are many, 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 many good Greeks and, and Cypriots, of course in Britain, there's a lot of Cypriots. Um, definitely see their legacy as a world legacy, not, not a, a nationalist one. And, and, and that's been, very important to me. Do you know what? Today is Kazantzaki's birthday. I was, so I happened to have spent this morning thinking about Kazantzaki because uh, are you still there? You've gone. We're all here. Yeah. It so happens that today is Kazantzaki's birthday and uh, reading all those novels uh, in my 20s was um, what a big soul. What a big soul. Megalopsychia is the Greek word. So. Thank you. Megan and then Catherine. You have to remember that for me now, it's eight o'clock at night. Right. I've had two, we're, two surgery. We're and going two to, glasses. We'll, we'll wrap it up with Megan and Catherine, okay? Okay. Because I'm, I'm, I'm not as sober as you are. How do you know? <laughs> Good one. Megan and Catherine, and then we'll wrap it up. All right, hi. Well, first, thank you for an amazing talk. And um, my question basically comes from the fact that I'm a former UCSD student, so I know Professor Lair. And oh, wow. With, yeah, and so being uh, in the UCSD literature program, I had to spend plenty of time working on a second language. Spanish, to be specific, is what I chose. Spanish, okay. Um, but from my perspective as a student, and I think many students around now share this uh, perspective, is that choosing a second language tends to be a very practical matter. You choose something to make yourself more employable. So I chose Spanish. I live in Southern California. It's a very common language here. And so how do you think an interest in Latin or Greek, which may not be seen as super common or super practical in this very capitalist sense, how do you think an interest in these languages could be revived when this is possibly a common mindset? Oh, how can they be revived? Well, as I say, my priority, certainly at secondary level, is, is, it has not been linguistic. My priority has been to get any kind of study of Greek and Roman culture, civilization, and history into mythology, into schools. Right, I, I, I cannot see a way economically or practically 
of making them available, it, certainly in Britain at secondary level. What I would say to anybody, I'll be down in one minute, guys. No, it's okay. Okay, sorry. Family's getting hungry. <laughs> um, what I would say, and again, this goes about the, this is a bit Monty's question and exceptionalism. I honestly believe the greatest literature ever in the entire world in any, is in ancient Greek. I actually think that ancient Greek gives you access to more stuff than anything else. I, on, I honestly believe that. So for me, Greek has been my life. Uh, knowing Greek has unlocked the doors to so much pleasure as well as so much uh, that's useful. Um, why would we want the greatest to me intellectual body of work produced ever by homines sapientes? Uh, I, that would be my argument. This is the big one. Great. Catherine, um, you have the last question, please. Could you unmute yourself, please, Catherine? Sorry, yes, thank you. Um, Hi, Catherine. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you so much for your presentation, your life's trajectory, and your brilliant public works. Um, we're, we're so lucky to have you. Sorry, I'm touched. Um, particularly striking, one little factoid you threw out about British miners reading Plato and so forth. I can't imagine our miners in West Virginia, for example, or Kentucky, picking up Plato. I could be totally wrong, but that in itself is amazing. Could you enlighten me a little bit that, a little bit there? Um, I have roots in West Virginia because my father was family was from Asia Minor and came to West Virginia. And oh, they wow. Were, but this fascinates me. Okay, well, it may be quite a British thing, uh, though I, I, I know from skim reading that similar things apply with the French working class, for example. But the miners' libraries was, was, was one of the major impetuses to everything in, in the book you need is the, a people's history of classics. If you email me, I will send you a free PDF. I will send a free PDF to anyone who wants it. I am not trying to make money out of this book. I'm serious. Anybody who emails me, I will send a free PDF. And it's all in there. But the miners were particularly, uh, since actually the 18th century, they had a tradition of building libraries. I think they were particularly bored. I think I, th I think that mining was unbelievably tedious, um, and certainly in Britain, a lot of them were nonconformists, which was part of the big impetus because you either went to the pub and got unbelievably drunk because it was also horrible down the mine after your twelve-hour shift, or you went off to the library, right? And when I discovered the miners' library tradition in South Wales, I simply couldn't believe it. And this was during the miners' strike. I was actually introduced to it, and they had an absolutely, you know, systematic policy of putting a little bit of money towards this collective library. And of course, there was no Latin and Greek in it. Nobody's been sent down the mine at the age of ten ever had the leisure to learn Latin and Greek, right? But these libraries were stuffed with detective novels and Victorian fiction and Dickens and Hardy and translations of Plutarch's lies and translations of Plato and Aristotle's greatest works, Epictetus, Aesop. There was a sort of alternative curriculum of classical authors. Um, and as I say, I can document, it's all documented in, 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 in that particular book. Um, I'm not quite sure why the miners are quite so edgy. They, Keir Hardy, who founded the British Labour Party, was a Scottish miner who, after 12 hour shifts, used his miners li pit head library to teach himself not just reading the Plutarch and the Epictetus and the Plato and the Thucydides, but he actually did teach himself Latin because he had sussed that this was the language of the elite. And if he was gonna form a political party that was ever gonna get seats in parliament, 
he had to be able to swipe back at the Latin tags, right? He actually sussed that, which I think is brilliant, okay? Um, but it is all in that book. I, I, I'm sure you're right. Other people in the States have told me, I've had quite a lot to do with various working class um, no, in academic projects about the working class in Chicago. And they say there is nothing equivalent to these traditions of libraries. So, as I said, every situation is different, but um, certainly in Britain, the trade union movement, some of it goes back to Wesley as well. The Methodists uh, insisted that their preachers who were often very working class and illiterate learn, for example, the basic tenets of ancient rhetoric. So they would, um, have read to them extracts from Cicero and Aristotle on rhetoric. Brilliant. You. But it's just, a, it is a, a different tradition. Edith, I'm sure you have commitments. You've been very generous with your time. I wanna thank all of you who've had the time to stay through. I think this has been a wonderful opportunity and a terrific provocation for us uh, here at UCSD to rethink many of the ways in which we think about the teaching and study of classics. Your example personally and professionally has been an inspiration to us. And I hope that when we can all travel again, we will be able to host you personally here, take you to the- Can't wait. And Can't wait. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you all. Sunshine. Sunshine. Thank you. Thank you.